All right, everyone, uh, welcome back to Beer School today. Uh, today we're gonna take on one of the more recent and one of the more exciting uh, types of beer that's been out really in the last um, several years, 10 years. Um, the 10 years that craft beer has been on this huge upswing, somewhere between the neighborhood of five to 15% in each of those years, has really fueled a lot of interest, a lot of money, and a lot of attention given to the scientific side of the brewing world. And no style has received the benefit of that as great as the New England IPA, and that's what we're going to be trying today. Uh, traditionally known as the New England IPA, now known as Hazy IPAs or GC IPAs or simply as NE IPA, um, these beers have really gone uh, totally mainstream, um, extending from a small group of breweries that uh, operated in the Vermont, the Boston, uh, pretty much the New England envelope of regions. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, one of the reasons why people like these beers so much is because they're an IPA that's not all that bitter. It has a lot of different things going on to it other than just bitterness. In the last couple of weeks, we've really talked a lot about uh, West Coast IPAs because they're dry, they're crisp, they're refreshing, all those values. These beers are not going to be that way even though they are an IPA and they are still hop dominant, just not bitter dominant. And that's the reason why some people who have traditionally had problems with the bitterness in a West Coast IPA will find favor with these New England IPAs or hazy IPAs because brewers have stepped back on the bitterness to celebrate the other aspects of the hops, which is the hop aromatics and the hop flavors. There's other components of these beers that make them juicy, to make them radiant. And it's really easy for most folks to sort of say, well, it's just a less bitter IPA. The truth is there's a lot that goes into changing a beer from a West Coast approach to a New England approach. And it doesn't just include the hops. So let's go through some of the things that changes going from a traditional American IPA to something more of the hazy IPA. The hops are the front and center. That's the centerpiece of flavors. And so what the brewers there are doing, they're backing off of that 70 IBU range and come down to an IBU range of somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe even as low as 20 IBUs to maybe 50 IBUs. And that seems to be a wheelhouse of uh, bitterness that, that suit these uh, flavors well. It doesn't overtake the palate. They allow the fruit aromatics to do that. They're using hops that are some of the newer hops, the Citra, the Mosaic, and a lot of other really kind of cool hops that are out there today. I know the high wire beer that we're going to be trying today celebrates a new Zappa hop and Azaka hops. We'll get into that a touch later as well. Um, but the, hop, the, the hops that have the more radiant flavors, the more radiant aromas are kind of your newer hops. And so those are the ones that are actually going to be more priced than these beers. Not saying you can't use some of those older hops, but don't use those older hops exclusively. I find that most IPAs work best whenever you use a variety of either two or three different varieties of hops in a New England IPA. At least half of those varieties need to be the newer hops, the ones that are priced for high aromatics, high flavor, and the bitterness isn't the sharp piney stuff. It's a little softer, it's a little bit more herbal um, and not as harsh on the back of the palate. But the changes don't just stop with the hops. The changes actually extend as the other major ingredients of the beer. When we're talking about the grain profile, we're looking at um, a West Coast IPA that would be almost predominantly pale two row malt. Uh, and now we're looking at other malts like wheat malts, oats, and some other ingredients like that that are typically called cereal grains. So that bolsters the impression of um, juiciness in the beer. The sweetness that extends from those type of grains, that creaminess, that breadiness that extends from those kind of grains actually helps the beer to feel fuller. And if the beer has a fuller malt compound, it makes, it makes those hop aromatics and hop flavors go from uh, a citrusy hint uh, flavor to a little bit more of a radiant or branch ripe kind of flavor. So it really makes the malts, or it makes the hops expand on the palate because of something that's happening with the malts. Uh, when it comes to the yeast choices, things change too. We're not looking at the uh, Chico yeast or the traditional American yeast to do the heavy lifting in these beers. Those yeasts usually dry the beer out to really uh, a high level of completion to make the hop bitterness stand out even more. Here we're going to use a yeast strain that actually is a lower attenuator, which means it's not capable of eating as much of the sugars and turn to dryness, alcohol, and carbonation. Instead, you're left with a little residual sweetness, and that sweetness keeps the hops tasting a little bit more plumper, a little bit more radiant. And so you get that uh, expansion of, of the hops through what the yeast is doing also. Uh, the yeast that we're choosing is a, some sort of derivative of, new, of British yeast which means they're gonna have a little bit of fruit esters. And those fruit esters fuse with those hop aromas and hop flavors very, very well to the point where it's hard to tell whether that fruitiness you're tasting is hop derived or whether it's yeast derived. So that's another trick that they're using there as well. 
Uh, last but not least, even the water has to change a little bit going from a different kind of beer uh, type of IPA. Uh, the water sources that you use in a traditional IPA or a West Coast IPA should be very calcium heavy, which means the calcium in the beer is a mineral that really highlights hot bitterness. And so it makes those beers seem crisper, snappier, more bitter, a little bit stronger, a little bit more of a bite on the back of the, the, the tongue. These beers, the New England IPAs, won't use that kind of water profile. They use the opposite water profile, which is a bicarbonate heavy uh, water profile. And what that does is it highlights the malt aspects. It makes the beer smoother. It will take away from the hot bitterness, which is what's preferred in these sort of beers, and it will enhance the juiciness of the malt, and in, there, uh, in turn, increase the juicy impressions from the hop compounds or the hop aromas and flavors that we're really after. So if you see, these beers are almost as radical in their changes as a stout would be to a pilsner, even though we're still talking about IPA pieces and parts that go into making each beer taste the way that they do. Now, a little bit of the history on this beer is really quite fascinating. It really took some of those brewers in the New England area to, to kind of talk with some other scientists, uh, molecular scientists, about what's happening with beer. Because traditionally, what the goal had been was to make a beer kind of dry and make it kind of clear. And the reason there is because those beers have less phenolic material inside of the, the can or the bottle, and that leads to greater shelf stabilization. So even though in the IPAs of 30 years ago, um, they wanted to retain a lot of hop flavor, wanted to retain a lot of hop bitterness, uh, but they knew the filtration process would remove a lot of those flavors, a lot of those aromas, a lot of that character. Um, but they felt like shelf stability was so important that they had to do it. Over time, we kind of learned, hey, this, if, if an IPA is a little hazier, then it has more flavor, but we know that's not, it's a little bit more perishable, so we need to drink it a little faster. And about 15, 20 years ago, that's whenever IPA drinkers become very cognizant about the age of their IPAs. They knew not to drink an old IPA, uh, especially if it has a little bit more hazier of a content to it. it uh, it's going to taste plumper, it's going to taste better. So they took that notion, they said, okay, what if we expound that? What if we make the beer even more hazy? Would that have some sort of validity? And really you gotta look back to what's happening in Hefeweiss beers. Hefeweiss beers uses a very fruity yeast from Germany um, and they use wheat. And what that wheat has done um, is it, it retains a lot of the medium weight molecular proteins and other phenolic materials in the beer and it makes the, the, the beer creamier, it makes it a little bit more uh, plump, it makes it a little bit more richer. Hefeweizens are really prized for being highly complex flavored beers without being very taxing on the system, without being taxing on the palate or very taxing on the stomach. And we also know that those sweet beers are fairly perishable as well, so you need to drink them fresh as well. And so some of these scientists said, well, if those hop, com or I'm sorry, if those fruit compounds available in the esters of the wheat beers uh, and the wheat uh, pieces and parts materials are linking up together and fusing a molecule, uh, and that molecule stays present in the beer, is that what giving Hefeweizens their unique kind of flavor and complexity? And if so, can we apply that to IPA hop aromatics uh, and hop flavors? And the answer is yes. So they started brewing beer with a little bit more uh, phenolic material, some cereal grains and whatnot and so forth. So what they decided to do is try to crush the grains, mash the grains, and whatever they do to the grains to go into the beer to give it a little bit more of a malt presence. And so the malt presence, they're actually pieces of parts of the grains of the barley that stay in suspension and uh, give those hot molecules something to attract to. So when that happens, they also realize that the barley might not be the best grain suitable for this because barley contains husks and those husks contain a lot of tannins. So if you try to put a lot of those medium weight molecular proteins from the barley into the beer, what you're in up with is a very astringent, very tannin heavy beer and that's not preferred. People just won't drink that. So they switch gear to the other grains. The oats, uh, the wheat are the major catalysts when it comes to some of those other grains because they don't have a husk. But they have all those kind of bready, protein heavy, starchy kind of substances that stay in the beer very readily without the influence of the husk. So the beer becomes very smooth and very cereal like. Sometimes you'll hear these beers talk about their pastry malt presence or some other kind of flavors like that. And that's the reason why is because the oats and the wheat really gives the beer a little bit more body, a little bit more creaminess. It gives a little bit more weight. Those extra sugars kind of do the same thing too. And so that was kind of the birth of a New England IPA. And so one brewery that's very prominent in the New England area kind of caught wind of, okay, let's make a beer like this. And of course that beer became very, very popular and everybody kind of clamored it. That's Hattie Topper from the Alchemist Brewing Company. Uh, wasn't long after that, so their neighbors started learning about these techniques and these, these ways that kind of infuse more hot flavors into the beer. Um, so 
uh, wasn't long, the Hill Farmsteads and some of the other uh, breweries up in that area really caught on. Eventually, a, uh, an apprentice is going to quit or be released from a brewery. They'll go to work at another one. They'll start sharing secrets. And before you know, this becomes a very widespread uh, kind of momentum builder. Um, Ten years ago, eight years ago, we saw that happening in that region. Since then, it's spread out a lot more. That's whenever we started seeing uh, the name change from a New England IPA to a hazy IPA. It turns out if you're in the South, if you're in the Midwest, if you're on the West Coast, you're fine making these beers, but you don't want to give New England all the credit for establishing this brand. You simply want to say, hey, we're on the leading edge of this too, so we're not going to call it a New England beer. We're going to call it a very generic hazy beer. So that's kind of where those beers have come from. That's kind of where they're going. And the examples we have for you today are uh, a little bit more broader in uh, kind of presence. Uh, keep in mind that whenever a brewery puts a, one of these hazy IPAs into a can and ships it other places other than their own community, uh, some things can change. So they, a lot of breweries know that, hey, if we employ more of the techniques of the West Coast stuff and also borrow some of the new techniques from the hazy stuff, maybe we can make a beer that has a little bit more shelf stability and won't be as perishable in case it does sit on the fridge or in case it does sit uh, on the shelf uh, a little bit longer, uh, maybe we prefer. Um, so they are making some concessions. Most of these breweries that we're going to be taste, uh, that you'll taste today um, have made a few little concessions to try to make the beer a little bit more stable. Now, if you want the full flavor, the full advanced kind of flavor of the New England IPA, it's best to enjoy them at brew pubs. Most breweries who do all those techniques we talked about earlier to make the beer taste as radiant, as plump as possible, you're going to get the benefit of all that uh, flavor at a local brew pub who specializes maybe in this style. Today we're going to taste West Six, and the locally to the Lexington market, Mirror Twin does a really nice job with those. Uh, so does Ethereal Brewing Company. So we have some breweries locally that do real well. However, most breweries do not want to package those beers and send them to go very far because they're just afraid that it's going to go downhill quickly and your impression of them as a brewer and the product of the, the brand of the beer will suffer because of that. So go to the brew pubs and taste these hazy IPs for yourself there. The fresher the better whenever it comes to these. So usually later in the program, whenever I tell you, do these beers age? These do not. Do not age in New England IPA. As a matter of fact, the moment you bought it, it's too late. It's already gone down here. You should have already drank it, okay? So get them cold as soon as possible and drink them on your way home if you can. Just make sure you walk there, don't drive there. So um, the varieties we have today is our own local uh, Wessex Low Beam. Really nice beer, available at the brew pub there for quite some time before they got confident enough to package it and send it to great places like the Beer Trap. Uh, so the Wessex makes a really nice uh, product and we've had this one almost year round for the last year. So the uh, dependability on this brand being available even outside the brew pub has increase too so we really like that with these some of the newer ones we just got in uh oscar blues the can of bliss uh can of bliss is a play on cannabis so of course they're going to use those hops that are most closely related to the cannabis plant uh the cannabis plant and the hop plant are cousins there's just a uh, very minor tweaks in the dna of one plant to make it create thc which we all know what that does or so we've heard about them um versus the other plant that creates basic hop resins so that's basically the trade-off you get right there whenever it comes to the two plants. And so whenever the plants are that similar, you can deduct that one can take on the characteristics of the other. And that's exactly what's happened with some of these hot varieties. And the Can of Bliss is one of those. Oscar Blues is a brewery that really does kind of celebrate that kind of herbal characteristic and the culture of the brands and the culture of the, of the taste of the beers. So uh, this beer has a little bit more of that herbal presence. Now keep in mind, most of these IPAs are going to have an herbal finish. They're not going to have that resinous bite in the back of their throat. Some of the bitterness you get out of some of these uh, beers can seem almost tea-like or somewhere like a fresh grassiness, a very pleasant parsley kind of grassiness. Sometimes mint qualities can come through on these as well. Sometimes the alcohol and some of those uh, herbal or botanical kind of flavors from the hops, they link up in such a way that it reminds me of a gin and tonic. Uh, so I get some of those flavors sometimes as well. Fancy Papers is one by Cigar City. Uh, this is a really nice one too. It has a little bit more of a lemon balm or lemongrass kind of presence in its finish. has a little bit more extra bite. You can tell that they're flirting very heavily with the New England style, but they're still um, very hesitant to let go of those uh, West Coast kind of roots. So this beer has a little extra bite to it as well. Hazy Jane by BrewDog has uh, been a very reliable beer here for quite some time. Again, a little bit more of a traditional hazy IPA with some West Coast qualities as well. Uh, just for a little bit more of a snappy character, quality, and flavor. Does a really nice job. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed having this one around for several years now, so it's a very dependable brand for us as well.
Uh, home style, if you're looking for the most authentic kind of New England flavor that we can depend on here at the Beer Trap almost day in, day out, it's Bearded Iris. Uh, they're the ones that's going to create a beer uh, that has a little bit more of all those hazy components without really holding on to a whole lot of those West Coast properties at all. So uh, these beers are a little bit more unstable. Uh, they never go bad for you, but when you get them fresh, it's very common for you to look on the bottom of the date and realize this home, home style is two days old, maybe three days old. Coming from Tennessee to Kentucky, is a very quick trip, so it's very common for us to get these beers exceptionally fresh. Uh, and then one we're going to wrap up with is one I haven't had yet. This is one that's on deck for me to try tonight after everyone leaves and I get to clean up the place. It's hazy and juicy and hoppy and fresh. That's a line of beers by Howard Brewing Company out of Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, this series of beer usually celebrates two or three different hop varieties, and usually it's hop varieties with very new hops. This one celebrates that Zappa hop I mentioned earlier. Zappa hop is a, is a hop that I'm not familiar with, but it's, I'm very curious about it because it, uh, the details on it says it's supposed to have uh, the characteristics of fruity pebbles and mint. So we're going to get into that and see if I taste any of those flavors and, and, uh, and the notes of this beer. So that pretty much wraps up the beer school portion for today. Uh, some other extra details about the beer. Uh, these beers usually don't go as high as 7% uh, like a lot of other IPAs do. They back off that a little bit because the hop bite can be accelerated by some of those techniques that accelerate the hops and the hop bitterness. And so they pull back on the bitterness. You also pull back on the alcohol content sometimes on some of these beers as well to make the balance work. Most of these beers around six, six and a half do better. 7% alcohol might prove just a little too much. Uh, the bitterness on these can be even low to medium. Uh, I would not call most of these a high bitterness beer, even though some of these can inch a little bit more toward the higher end, but most of the better ones are going to be low to medium bitterness, but the hot presence of the aromas and flavors is what's going to be paramount. Those should be through the roof. Um, the IPA glass I showed you last week is a traditional glass to drink these out of, or you can just choose a very standard, you know, pine glass, nonic tumbler type of uh, glass on that one. Um, Nothing really special about the glass there, but an IPA glass will probably still work the best. When you're looking at uh, food pairings, uh, I do switch these up. I don't go with the spicy carrot cake, ginger snaps, curries with these beers. I go a little softer uh, because these beers have a little bit more of an elegant malt profile and the hops uh, help facilitate that and I'll dominate it. So when it comes to foods, I really like a softer type of goat cheese, a mascarpone you know, in something that I work out real well, nice spread. Uh, entrees, uh, really go with like a lemon pepper shrimp. I'm gonna do a shrimp boil tomorrow for Memorial Day. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. So this would be really nice. The spices, those aromatics, those floral kind of compounds that come from uh, this, the shrimp, the lemon, all those sort of things, then suit these beers exceptionally well. So uh, you go a little bit softer with the food offerings, make some great summer beers, go with that great summer cuisine. And then whenever it comes to dessert, do a cheesecake. Don't be afraid to go a little bit more on the fruitier side, do like a lemon curd cheesecake, go with raspberry, blueberry, all those kind of flavors can resonate real well with the fruitiness that you find in these beers. Uh, next week, another hoppy trend. I'm just not sure which one it is. Too bad they don't pay me more. I figured that out a little bit earlier. So I'll put the information up on Tuesday. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, smoke signals, carrier pigeons. We'll get the word out there to you somehow about what we're going to have available for you next week. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you in a week.